That'll be it. They'll be through. It's all right. I'm leading. Good morning. Oh, everyone's miles away this morning. <laughs> Not blaming Kay, no. Well, good morning. It's nice to see everyone in fine voice, so I'm sure the singing's going to be great. There's so much chatter. Well, we come to worship and have fellowship together this morning, and we're going to read a, a couple of verses from Psalm 150. It's the last psalm in, in, the, in the book of Psalms from 150, and it's a, it's a psalm of praise. The ones before it talk about, the psalms before, talk about individual praise, uh, corporate praise, creation praising God, the kingdoms praising God, and then this one, it's all, all things praise God. And it talks about the sanctuary in the first uh, little verse there, a word we don't use very often, is it? It appears a lot in the Old Testament and only a few times in the New um, because really it's talking about the old, isn't it? The sanctuary is God's holy place. And for the Jews, it was a reflection of here's the temple, the sanctuary. And we don't have that anymore. Because it also gives us an impression of separation, doesn't it? Praise God in his sanctuary that he's there in his holy place. And yes, and we come down, we praise him for where he is. But we praise him in the heavens and we praise him on the earth. And we praise him with the musical instruments let everything that has breath praise the Lord, the psalm says. But through Jesus, we come this morning with full access. We don't have a sanctuary. We have free and open access to God because of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we still reflect this. We praise God in his holiness and we praise him here this morning. So let's just read together uh, verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. And we're going to stand to praise him and sing, Come People of the Risen King. So let's stand here to sing.
Well, the kids have had enough. <laughs> They're gone. That's fine. Let's continue in our worship uh, as we come to God uh, in prayer. Father God, we rejoice and give you the thanks and praise for where we are found this morning. We thank you for bringing us here to this place. We thank you that we have a building to come and worship in. We realize it could be anywhere, but we realize and we are thankful because we are so privileged that we are part of your family this morning. And you've called and chosen us to be part of your family, to be part of this fellowship. And Father, we thank you for how your hands has blessed us over this past week. And this morning we see your grace that is poured out upon us and for the ability that we're able to just come and gather together. Father, we are conscious of so many around the world, our brothers and sisters in Christ, who don't have the freedoms that we have, who don't have access to your word like we do, who live in fear and a persecution. And Father, we ask that you would just sustain them wherever they are at this moment. If they meet to gather in worship secretly, Father, just protect them. Give them the strength and courage to continue trusting in you, to be bold in the gospel, in sharing it with those around them, so that your name would be honored and glorified. And Father, forgive us for not making the most of the freedom that we have. Father, help us to be bold in the gospel, to tell those around us, that there is a great, almighty God, a loving Savior who wants to welcome them in. Father, help us to reach out to this community. Help us to uh, show Christ-like love to the community, our friends and neighbors at all times. And Father, help us within this fellowship that Christ would be seen in how we uh, behave towards each other, how we love each other and care for each other and respect each other and how your word is faithfully preached in this place. Father, we think of those who can't be with us this morning uh, because they may not well uh, through long-term illness or for other reasons. Father, we ask that you just bless them this morning. Let them know your healing hand upon them and that comfort and peace that can only come from you. And so, Father, we bring this time this morning and lay it in your hands. Father, open up our hearts and minds this morning as we worship and praise you, as we study your word. Father, let that word that has been prepared this morning just sink into our hearts and minds and that we would live it out each and every day for your honor and for your glory. Amen. We're going to come to our catechism, which will be on the screen. It's question 11, which says... Uh, what does God require in the sixth, seventh, and eighth commandments? And so we'll read the rest uh, together. Sixth. Pursuing even our enemies with love. Seventh. Sexual immorality. And live purely and faithfully whether in marriage or in single life, avoiding all impure actions, looks, words, thoughts or desires, and whatever might lead to them. Eight, that we do not take without permission that which belongs to someone else, nor withhold any good from someone we might benefit. We'll watch, oh sorry, a verse, which I'll read, give you a break. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now we're going to watch a, a video to expand on that. Well, Christians are obligated to obey the Ten Commandments, and what we find in the Ten Commandments are the laws of God. And what we find in Jesus' interpretation in the Sermon on the Mount is that the standards of the law are much higher than we had assumed. It's not just not committing 
uh, adultery and, and uh, not murdering and not stealing. But Jesus says uh, in interpreting uh, the Sixth Commandment that if you harbor bitterness, if you're unable to forgive people, if you call them raka, that is to consider them a non-person, then you've murdered that person in your heart. He also says that if you lust in your heart, uh, not merely engaging in the act of adultery, but if you lust in your heart, then you're breaking the Seventh Commandment. And if you're being greedy or if you're materialistic and you're not radically generous. So the, Jesus raises uh, the awareness of the commandments to the highest level. And we also find uh, from Luther's writings when he says that you cannot break the rest of the commandments without first breaking the first one. And that is that you are looking at other things as your ultimate value and your God uh, besides God himself. And he also said that when there is a negative prohibition in the Ten Commandments, that a positive uh, implication is assumed, therefore, that if you, uh, it says that you ought not to uh, murder, it also means that you ought to radically love others, even neighbors and enemies. And when it says that you ought not to uh, commit adultery, the assumption is, is that you're supposed to be faithful to your wife or to your husband, or to recognize sexuality as something that is beautiful uh, gift from God. And therefore you ought, if you're in a marriage relationship, to recognize that it is a covenantal commitment uh, between a man and a woman. And when it says that you ought not to steal, uh, the, the understanding is that you ought to be radically generous. So this is uh, the responsibility that a Christian has in responding to the Ten Commandments. But the problem here is, is that we're unable uh, to obey them perfectly. So how are we going to resolve that tension? Well, G Jesus Christ, who is the second Adam, who is the, uh, the true Israel, who is that individual, divine, corporate head and representative, who has come to fulfill the obligations of the law perfectly in himself, that obedience and righteousness now gets imputed into our lives, and therefore, giving us the ability to be able to obey uh, the obligations and the demands of the law. Even when we don't obey them perfectly, we know that we are not going to be crushed by the law and we will have confidence in the desire to obey the law of God because we know that Jesus Christ has fulfilled those requir requirements uh, perfectly for us and therefore that we can do it without fear, that we will not receive the favor uh, from God uh, through our disobedience or lack of obeying perfectly, but we know that Jesus Christ has accomplished all these things, fulfilling, fulfilling the requirements of the law perfectly for us. Well, praise God for Jesus after that. Uh, just going to pray before we continue. Faithful shepherd of our souls, you created us to live in love and fellowship on the earth but we fail in that again and again. May your love rule every relationship so that we walk in purity, putting away lust, covetousness, and greed. For your name's sake, amen. We're going to stand and sing, uh, trust and obey. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, we're going to uh, come to the communion table now. Uh, just got a few verses to read in a minute. But I had a thought the other day is that whether you've ever noticed, so on the poster over there, on the poster here, it's also uh, on the website and on the app and on any literature that the church puts out. There's a logo with Bank Hall Mission on it, and underneath it says Faith, Hope, and Community. And it just struck me, you know, that's what we are here for this morning. We are brought together with faith, in hope, and because we are a community. And there's just some verses uh, from Hebrews 10 I want to read. Hebrews 10, 19 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up for us through the, through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spare one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Through Jesus, we are drawn together this morning to remember. We are very privileged. that We can come and we can take of this bread and cup to remember what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. His body broken, his blood shed on our behalf. So that we can come this morning forgiven, washed, and united as one body filled with one spirit. Faith, hope, and community. That's what we are this morning. That's what we come in this morning. We come in faith. We come with this blessed hope and we come to encourage each other as one body. Yes, we're all different. Yes, we might have different ideas and different backgrounds, but we're united through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. So all those differences, all those things that pollute our mind are put aside because we have the spirit, one spirit flowing through our veins this morning. We have the Lord Jesus Christ binding us all together. And we give praise and thanks as we take these emblems to our precious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What privileged and blessed people we are. I'm going to ask Trevor and Neil if they'll come up. Trevor's going to give thanks for the bread and the cup. We have an open table. It is there for anyone here to take this morning if you know and love the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. We ask, if you don't, then let it pass by. This is a celebration for those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in how thankful we are for us to be reminded because we're human and we have to be reminded constantly because when we go out those doors, we forget. Life gets in the way and we forget just how blessed we are. We forget how forgiven, how washed clean we are, and how we are united as one people. So Trevor will give thanks, and then they'll give out the bread, and as normal, please retain the bread, and we'll take it together, and then after that, the cup, the same. Please hold on to it, and we'll take it together, just to show that unity, that we are one, one body, praising our one and only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Trevor will give thanks. Christ, if we trust in Christ, if we trust
For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father God, we realize we are such a blessed people this morning. Blessed because we come to celebrate our wonderful salvation. We have this confidence of sins forgiven, of being washed clean, this wonderful hope of a future with you. And Father, we rejoice in that. We rejoice of that wonderful sacrifice that the Lord Jesus Christ made on our behalf. We rejoice that he willingly died and gloriously rose again from the dead. Father, we thank you that sin and death are conquered. And we have this wonderful joy and hope uh, before us. Father, as we have been reminded of this great sacrifice, help us to live lives worthy of that calling, of being part of your family. Help us to be a true community here, showing Christ-like love to each other, encouraging each other and building each other up in the faith so that your name is honored and glorified. Amen. We're going to uh, stand and sing, and Neil and Trevor, while we're doing that, are are going to uh, collect uh, the glasses Musicians will get ready because we're going to sing uh, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
You can sit down. So just the usual notices. And I think people zone out at this bit, don't they? So, because <laughs> no one ever knows, yeah, especially you, Paul, you never know what's going on. So <laughs> they're always on the screen before the service, during the service, and after the service. And we remind you, you've got no excuse for not, for not, for not knowing what's going on in the week, okay, and what's coming up. So it's on a loop. So at the end, you can stand there and you can watch the screen and see what comes up. But I'll tell you. So it's the usual this week, Monday, the ladies' meeting, Tuesday and Wednesday, small groups. Uh, oh, and Tuesday, football on, Neil, yes. Uh, Friday, Friday club. And God willing, next Sunday, Pastor will be continuing in our series through Exodus. Uh, you'll see a notice, to, uh, put it on each week. And as we mentioned, if you want to know what's going on, please use the church website. There's a calendar there. Everything's there. You can look at past sermons. There is also, for those who want to, there is a church app. The more people that use it, the better, because it means that I'm forced to keep things up to date or the leadership when I give them uh, full access to it. You can download it on Android or uh, Apple. If you go to the store and look for our church, it's that symbol, and then you can type in Bootle and it'll tell you, it'll come up with uh, two, but you pick the mission, you can log in, you'll get an email, you have to confirm, and then you'll get login details. Uh, so I'm trying to sell this. The more people that get it, the better, because I'll keep it up to date. On there, you, if you're logged in, um, you can see past sermons, you can get sermon notes as well on there. There's a transcript of the sermon, uh, which will be on there. There is rotors on there as well. Uh, so if you need to know what rotor you're on that Sunday because you've forgotten you're on creche or you're on tea and coffee, it'll tell you. And there's Bible readings as well. You can see what's coming up in the week, whether it's Tuesday study group or on Wednesday or the, the following Sunday, you can read the passage before you come. So it's worth getting, and we can push out prayer notifications as well on it. There's, there's all sorts on it, and there's stuff for you to put uh, prayers on as well. That's me. That's that plug done. For the ladies, uh, next Saturday, is it? There's yeah. the Women's Day Conference, which is at, is that at Bethel Green Lane. Yeah. Uh, I haven't paid attention. I zone out on the notices. You do need to be booked in. I think there's a few booked, but... Uh, it's free, but if you, it's ladies, if you'd like to go, CK, she can get you uh, booked in. For the men, it's been on the screen for quite a few weeks. There's the Wirral's Men's Conference. That's the 11th of May. Again, you need to book in for that. Uh, that's £10 if you're interested in that. There is a QR code, you, whether that's clear enough. But if you go online, you can see it as well. Uh, you can book into that. And another thing for the men... Uh, we're looking at doing another men's breakfast, which is on Saturday, the 6th of April, half eight in the morning. If the men are interested, we'll be carrying on doing the book as well. So it'll be the next three chapters of the book, uh, four, five, and six. Is that right, Eddie? Yeah. Uh, okay. They're not big chapters, uh, and it's just helpful. We had a good discussion last time around tables and a nice breakfast. Uh, it was an encouraging time. So if you can... Please put your name on the sheet, uh, on the clipboard here on the table. Men, you, I know you're useless at this, putting your names down, but please try and remember, if, you, if you're free, 6th of April, put your name on the clipboard for breakfast for half eight uh, and read the next three chapters of the book. And I think that's it. So before uh, Pastor comes to speak... Uh, we're going to stand and sing uh, one more song. There is one gospel. So let's uh, stand to sing. <laughs>
be seated. Well, good morning to you all. Morning. It's uh, lovely to have you all here sharing together in uh, our worship and our ministry, and we pray that God will bless us as we gather now around his word to read and think about it. Just uh, one matter about the uh, men's breakfast uh, on the 6th of uh, April. Also on the 6th of April, Seng and Alala are going to be hosting some of the Hong Kong uh, friends that they have, uh, uh, and they're going to do a meal uh, in, the, in the back hall. Uh, so we can pray about that as they continue to make engagement uh, with uh, those, uh, the, the Hong Kong people, um, not believers, but uh, they're able to share, and uh, we just pray for them as they have that uh, time together on that particular Saturday. If you have your Bibles open at uh, Exodus chapter 12, that's uh, what we're going to be looking at today as we share uh, in this uh, book. So if you have your Bibles there, keep them open. Uh, we're going to read uh, certain sections as we go through. Uh, so if you keep them open for the time, then uh, we'll cover off the narrative that is before us today. Uh, we live in a city, don't we, that uh, should know something about justice. Uh, justice uh, for the 96, uh, the 97 as it is now, was of course that which came out of the tragedy uh, that is known as uh, Hillsborough. It was a devastating day and it was compounded by an immediate misrepresentation of the events uh, of uh, the day. And there would be a long battle to get to the point where the presentation of what happened, the truth, uh, would be understood. A variety of public bodies uh, were covering things up. Uh, police reports were being changed to follow a particular narrative that would blame uh, the Liverpool fans for all that went on. And so these travesties were exposed, and justice was, to some measure, seen to be done. And justice is part of what life is. And we would argue that we have uh, a desire for justice because we're actually made in the image of God. It's not some kind of a evolutionary thing that uh, just happens so that we need to survive, so there's got to be some kind of fairness. We believe there's a fairness and there's a desire for justice because we're made by God and we reflect some of his uh, attributes in that manner. And God is a God of justice. And something of it is identified in who he is and in who we are and how we should conduct ourselves. Last time, uh, we looked at the nine plagues and, uh, among other things, identified the nature of God's judgment, his rightness to judge. And that was being played out. Each plague was a sign, was a warning and was an exposure of sin and wickedness. And you could argue each plague is a giving time uh, for people to repent. Of course, Pharaoh hardens his heart, and his heart is hardened, and we looked at that last week. But we reach now the last plague, the final one. It's the killing of the firstborn over all the land. It will affect all people, Egypt and Israel. Two elements, I think, are being presented, uh, themed for us in our sermon today, and that is judgment and salvation. And we're going to look at these by thinking about chapter 12 and the nature of what then is the Passover feast. And I think the theme is picked up for us in verses 12 and 13 of this chapter. Let's just read those verses for a moment, and then we're going to have our, our reading for the first section. But in verses 12 and 13, this is what God is saying. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Here's the judgment. Verse 13, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, 
and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. There's the salvation, there's the deliverance. Two things happening at the same time. Well, let's uh, follow through on those themes. Now, we're going to read the first 20 verses of uh, chapter 12. Follow in your Bibles or follow on the screen as we read the text. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for the household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make uh, your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it unto the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And then you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute. Forever you shall keep it as a feast. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses, for if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a uh, holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days, but what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared for you. And you shall observe the feast of the unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought your host out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month, from the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening for seven days. No leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing unleavened in all your dwelling places. You shall eat unleavened bread. So in the first instance, we have God speaking to Moses. We've been traveling uh, through Exodus, haven't we? We've been hearing the emotion and the challenge uh, to the Jewish people as they are in slavery, as they're in, under oppression, and as they are in captivity. And they're facing all of these things. And now we come to this final plague as we've been journeying with them. We've learned about the character of God in all of the various events, that he's right to bring judgment. Indeed, he could, and he tells us himself, easily have expunged the whole of the nation of Egypt. Back in chapter 9 and uh, verse 15, uh, we read what uh, God says there, For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and all your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. He could have easily just destroyed the whole land if he wanted to. He has stayed, stayed away from that. He's given warnings, but judgment is going to fall, and it will fall here on this uh, people with their rebellious nature and their life of disobedience. God's going to come. And God now prepares Moses and Aaron for this last plague, the killing of the firstborn of human and livestock 
throughout the country. And dates are important, aren't they? And we have in verse uh, 1, the Lord said to Moses, in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. We know them in our own lives, whether it's uh, birthdays, anniversaries, special occasions, uh, significant events. There are days, there are dates we do well not to forget, whether they're personal or in some cases they may be national. But in one way or another, we will celebrate or we will pause to reflect depending on the context of the date and the event. And here we have a precise date. This is set in the Jewish calendar, as it were. From now on, this date is all important. As you move forward, there are various things that are described here that will be for this day, for this particular feast at this particular time, but also it's going forward into other generations uh, when they will be having these feast days. But it is an important date. It's written large. So, God willing... Uh, what is it, a fortnight, we will celebrate as a Christian community the wonderful knowledge of Christ's death and Christ's resurrection. We do it every Sunday because every Sunday is telling us about Christ, that he's alive. But that special occasion in the calendar of our year where we join together as a church family and we all seem to sing just a little bit better as we rejoice shouldn't be that way, I guess, but there's a sense of that. There's the moment as we just praise God for Christ and his death, for Christ and his resurrection, and that Christ is alive today. And this date is set here for the people of God in this Old Testament context. This Passover feast, an important moment, and God is initiating the feast. It's not the idea of Moses it's not something he's conjured up. It's what God has given as all important. It's going to be critical in the lives of the people. One author has said that uh, previously, the theme tune through the nine plagues has all been about deliverance and rescue. But now there's an element of that, but also redemption from death, dealing with with the, the final problem for all humanity. And certain things will need to be in place because of the death to the firstborn and to the livestock. Because this death is going to be without discrimination, judgment is going to fall on everybody. Such is the importance of the message that the whole congregation or community will need to hear it. It's a kind of moment, you know, when... Uh, the BBC, for instance, say they, 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 when the Queen died. So we're interrupting this program to tell you the Queen is dead. And uh, big moments, they feel everybody needs to know one way or another. Well, here, it's a big moment, and all Israel needs to hear what's going on. And he speaks to Moses in the first instance. But the community will need to hear, for the future is within the firstborn of the seed, as it were, and the seeds need to be preserved and serve the fuller plans and purposes of God. Something's going to happen in the future, and God's ensuring that will take place. Well, what are they to do? Well, all the instructions are there. They're to get a lamb, that they get the best one. They're to ensure, ensure that the household, all the household needs are met. But also, if there are others in the community who need to be catered for, then they should be too. The manner of cooking is identified. There's a sense that this is to be no leisurely meal because this is the meal when they need to be ready to go. They need to have the staff in their hands. Uh, the walking stick needs to be ready. They're going to be on the march. So they will eat with haste. Everything is going to get destroyed and they're going to move out in over this uh, night period. And so they need to be ready for all of that. And everything is necessary because God is coming in judgment. But if they're obedient, trusting, and act in faith, then there will be mercy, there will be deliverance, and death will be defeated. How is this achieved? It's achieved through sacrifice. 
through the lamb that is given. The blood is applied to the doorpost, and so they will be protected from the moment of death. It's an anecdotal story, I think, told by some of the, the rabbis, uh, that on the night of uh, this occasion, um, the, the firstborn in the family would come to the father and would say, is the blood on the door? And dad would say, yes, it's on the door. Don't worry. Are you sure it's on the door? Why? Because he's the one that his life is going to be taken. Now, we don't have that in Scripture. But for sure, they needed to have the blood placed or else their firstborn child is going to die within the family as the angel of death comes. So we have the language of Passover, and this feast is then something of major significance for the night that is to be faced, but also for the future of the nation. But it also has ram uh, massive ramifications for God's plan of salvation. Death is to be faced, but it's to be fully met by what God provides, and God in the, in the future will provide Christ, and Christ will come, and he will meet death head on, and defeat it totally. John is able to declare in the New Testament, the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The book of Revelation often speaks uh, about the Lamb. The elders see a Lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes. Hebrews tells us how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The lamb without blemish that they would take on, the, uh, on this Passover, there's a lamb without blemish who will be killed in the future days. Uh, we've made the reference before, haven't we? When Jesus is going up to Jerusalem as the lamb, it's Passover time. And maybe there are lambs getting carried up by the Jewish people. But the lamb is going up. So that no longer will this feast have to be reckoned and uh, done because it's telling us Jesus accomplishes everything. Paul writes to the church at Corinth. He says, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Leaven was often associated at some points with, with, with evil in the sense of uh, the, the, the old material would infect and permeate. Of course, that was a good thing in the sense of making bread. But it becomes a picture. You see what leaven does. You need to cast the old leaven out. God is making judgment, but also making provision for safety and security and deliverance. And what this shows to us is what it takes to ensure that humanity can be in relationship with God. It's the Lord's Passover. This is the only thing that will deal with death. Here we are this morning. The only way that our spiritual lives can be dealt with is through what Jesus has provided. Interesting, in the book of Luke, in um, chapter 9, uh, I think it's chapter 9, it's, uh, he says this, Now about eight days, it's transfiguration up the mountain, uh, Peter, John, and James with Jesus. Eight days after these things, he took with him Peter, John, and James, and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white, and they could see all of this. Behold, two men were talking with him, with Jesus, Moses and Elijah, uh, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. It's an amazing conversation, I think. We don't have the record, but they're talking about Jesus and his exodus. That's what departure means. Rare on this mountain, what's going to happen? I'm going to my death. I'm going to make sure that as the Passover lamb, I'm going to deal with that which is humanity's problem and bring them back to know God. Well, that's our only hope. We sing the hymn, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. 
Will you come today? Will you know the only hope is a lamb who was slain, King Jesus? Moses speaks to the elders, that's the second thing, verses 21 to 28. Um, and its section looks a little bit uh, of a repetition. We're going to read those verses. Uh, then Moses, verse 21, called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And he, when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and he will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike it. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, he is, as he's promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. And then the people of Israel went and did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. So here the people are being told. That is, the elders are being instructed so that they can go out to all the community and make sure that everybody has the message and make sure that everybody will adhere to what is required. It's a message that cannot be ignored. It can't be treated in a casual fashion. It must be conveyed in a serious uh, manner with preciseness. You can't afford to get it wrong. can't take a few notes and think, oh, I'm sure there's something I've forgotten. But it doesn't really matter. No, this matters. This message matters. And it must be conveyed in all of its detail. But without going into all the detail and the stuff that's being used, I think we can learn three things. Um, from this moment, uh, remembering the whole judgment salvation element that is playing through. But first of all, verse 25, uh, we have this which is pointing forward. The people have felt burdened and challenged for some time. Uh, when Moses spoke to them previously in chapter 6, Moses spoke to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. They weren't ready, they couldn't take it. We're all messed up, and it's all terrible. We've no indication that the burdens have got any easier. But as this message is delivered, then there's the, the defining that there are days of hope ahead. This is the Passover that you're going to keep now, but you're going to keep it in the future. This is going to be perpetuated into another day. As we face this final plague, there is hope ahead. Through the plagues... Egypt has been learning something, but so too have the Hebrew people. God is powerful. He is the I am that I am. And they've got to understand something of what that means. God is on display, and they can appreciate that there's a future ahead. The second thing is in verse 26, uh, that it is a, a teaching tool. Here there are any number of elements that will become a visual aid, uh, that will be the means of teaching a subsequent generation. Each time they come to the feast, the young people in the house may have a question. Why are we doing this? This is why we're doing this. This is all important feast. is when God passed over. He could have killed us. He could have taken our lives. But he chose to pass over us because he made a feast so that it would be possible for death not to be our experience. And so generations can gather in their host households and lessons can be learned and underlined. God's provision, the lamb sacrificed, deliverance from death, among other things. And then verse 28, the response can be seen. What do they do in verse 28? We're told that they worship. It's really the nation coming on a journey. Their knowledge of God has been established. They're presented with these covenantal truths. 
And the proper response, and the only response, is for hearts and minds moved to worship. To worship such a God as this. Well, we've been around a meal table today. And this looks back and it looks forward. A meal that tells of Jesus and all that he's done for us as the Lamb of Sacrifice. The one given for us. It gives us peace with God, but it also points forward to a hope. We're called to do this, to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We keep doing it. A day when it will no longer be set, and we will be enjoying the great feast in heaven as the table will be set there. This points forward. I hope you have that hope that you see these elements telling you there's another day, there's a better day. There's another land, there's a better land. There's another song, there's a better song. We're just singing it now, just beginning to sing praise, but there's another day when we'll gather in glorious praise, in a perfection of praise. And whatever else we'll be doing in heaven, we'll be enjoying the company of God's people and God himself. What a hope. But also we share in this and speak of these things to a growing generation. Your children ask you, what does this mean? Well, it only means one thing. You will teach your children, people coming into the church for the first time, we'll tell them what this means. It's a teaching tool and mechanism. It is the ultimate illustration. We only have two sacraments, the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of the Lord's table, telling us of all that Christ has done. So teach the next generation. Teach those who have no knowledge of Christ. Tell them about Jesus. That's where we're going to go not about ourselves, not about who we are. It's about this Jesus Christ, the one who passes over us because of the provision that he's made. So judgment is not to be experienced. It may be a, a judgment to commendation, if, if we could use that term, but the judgment to condemnation is not for the people of God. We are saved. And as we reflect on these things, we should worship. If we know Christ as Savior, then we should bow in wonder and thanksgiving afresh. It's in Christ alone our hope is found. Maybe we're struggling sometimes. Maybe we're finding it difficult, and it's not easy even to sing these praises. But just try and grasp your head and heart, speak into your life and say, but King Jesus is part of my life. He spared me. I'm his child forever. What a hope. What a blessing. And even though that heart is in despair, it lifts in praise. Thank you, Jesus. The last thing is uh, verses 29 to 40. Uh, maybe just read some of that. Um, as God speaks to the nation. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. And then he summoned Moses and Darren by night, and said, Up! Go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel. Go, serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And then we'll leave that there, but the children of Israel go out, uh, and then we have in the last verses the institution of the Passover, just to echo, just to cement everything that has happened here. But this night comes, as we finish just now. The night comes, the fearsome, awesome fearful event. Death punctuates the land of Egypt. God comes the, over the whole of the land, Goshen too. But in Egypt there is a cry. There's a wail. 
as judgment has arrived. After all of the warnings, after all of the other plagues, after all of the other intentions were made clear, this comes as well. And now Pharaoh relents, and the let my people go has been accepted. There is the release allowed. The population seek to speed this deliverance, send them on their way, giving them all the goods and the jewelry and whatever uh, they ask for. There is a mixed multitude that go, which is, suggests that some other groups um, of foreigners in any uh, join with them, maybe even some Egyptians, we know not. But there is more than the people of God. In any case, it's a time to make haste and have an exodus from the land. God speaks to the nations. God is speaking in judgment and salvation. Justice is important. God's judgment is right, legitimate, and proper. Evil, wickedness, sin, and rebellion must be visited. Paul, when he preaches a sermon in the New Testament, says this, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. That covers two, our two themes. God will judge, but God will bring salvation to those who have entrusted their lives into King Jesus. Christ is our only hope. He becomes our assurance. This is the call of the kingdom. Come and follow Jesus. As we finish, the fact of the matter is we all deserve judgment. We all deserve to be cast out of God's presence. And the people are saved here because of God's mercy and grace and his love. And may we know something of this salvation which is out of his provision, not out of our ability, not out of our gifting, not out of our expertise, not out of our spirituality. It's because God loves us. Just turn to God and say, thank you, Jesus, for what you've given me. And here's my life. Forgive me. Call to repent. Everything is here. Come to Jesus. Let's pray. And then we're going to sing our final hymn. Loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we have your word and we have your truth. Lord, help us to hear truth and help us to respond to it. And may King Jesus be the one that's part of our lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. So we're going to conclude by singing the hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glorious grace. We're standing and we're going to sing Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Yes.
And now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Do be seated. Remember, we have our refreshments served in the back hall. Do join with us as we share together uh, for that time. Men, if you're able to come to the breakfast, wherever that will be, just sign up and uh, we'll get some idea of numbers. Thank you.